Well, hi everyone. I am Tracy Page. I am the Aquatic Education Coordinator for the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. And this is our CARP Conundrum Program. So like I said, we um, at the DNR take care of natural resources, right? We're the Department of Natural Resources. And as the Aquatic Education Coordinator, what I do is try to help people understand our aquatic resources. So that includes the fish, the plants, the other animals that are in water and around water, and then also the habitats that are in and around water. So that includes our Great Lakes, rivers, inland lakes, and all those other wetlands and streams and um, bodies of water. So my goal is to help you understand them so that maybe you can appreciate them, want to get out there and use them, and maybe someday take care of them, right? You can be stewards of our environment. At the Department of Natural Resources, that's what we do. So if you have ever been camping, right? If you have ever been to one of our state parks to go hiking or one of our state parks to go to the beach, you're using the natural resources. And those natural resources are actually owned by you, the people of Michigan. So what we do at the DNR is we take care of them for you, right? And the money to do that comes from the users that are out there using the resource. So fishing licenses, hunting licenses, um, those little P's on your license plate sticker that gets you in so you can go camping at a state park. All of those fees go back to help the DNR take care of the natural resources for you. So part of what this program is about is understanding some incoming problems with invasive species, how we might be part of that big picture to take care of that, and then also what you might be able to do in the future, right? You guys are going to be voters someday and you're going to be going to college and you're going to be going um, into the world and learning all of these things and maybe being part of the solution, which is pretty cool. So what we want to do is learn about the carp conundrum. So let's see what you guys know. So this is my friend Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca works for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and she is holding a carp species that is invasive in the United States. And we're gonna learn which species in a little bit, but I should preface this with Rebecca's not tiny. She's about five foot six, and she um, is holding a fish that is very large, right? So these are not small fish. These are not small problems. We're talking about really big fish that can cause really big problems. So um, what are invasive species, right? I, I alluded that those carp are an invasive species in the United States, but what makes an invasive species? There are definitely some different things. So the basic definition of an invasive species is it's not from here. It's from somewhere else, right? It's not native to here. It is native somewhere else, just not here, right? And then it has to cause harm, either economic or environmental harm. So one, um, invasive species that we all know is like zebra mussels, right? Has anybody been out into a lake and walked around and cut your feet on zebra mussels? Little tiny guys with those hard, sharp shells that came from somewhere else to the Great Lakes area, and they're now an invasive species. So those cause environmental harm because they eat lots of plankton and they cover rocks in the bottom of the lakes and they outcompete native species, right? So they cause environmental harm, but they also cause economic harm because they clog up, you know, outlets and inlets for water and they clog up boat motors and all sorts of docks and other things. So they cause both economic and environmental harm. And if they did one or the other, they would still be an invasive species. Uh, most invasive species are totally our fault right? We either introduce them on purpose or we introduce them on accident. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. They can be plants, animals, diseases, right? So we very well know of a disease that's from somewhere else that came here and is causing problems, right? But those happen in lakes and in fish and in animals, right? So we've heard of chronic wasting disease in deer, right? Uh, tuberculosis in deer. So there are diseases in animal populations, just like there are in humans. And those can be either from here, native, or non-native or invasive, right? It can also be plants. Um, so a lot of the seaweed you find in a lot of inland lakes that you might go fishing on are invasive species. Um, there are native species there too, but invasive species outcompete and they take over. So those invasive species are good at what they do for some very specific reasons. I said they outcompete, right? So those zebra mussels cover rocks in the bottom and they cover boats and um, docks and all of those things where other mussel species that are native to Michigan don't do that. They also eat more plankton, right? By volume and 
they clean up the lakes a little too much, right? They don't leave enough plankton for the rest of the, the species. They reproduce quickly. So again, zebra mussels are great at that too, right? They make tons and tons of babies and throw them out into the water. And those babies settle down and turn into little mussels that are attached to those rocks. So they re reproduce usually faster and in greater numbers than our native species. Um, they usually grow really fast, right? So they go from being babies to adults and having babies very quickly, a lot quicker than our native species might. And they usually have few natural predators, right? So when sea lamprey became invasive in the Great Lakes, they, um, it's not that they don't have predators when they're young, because they might, but these sea lamprey, they use their suction mouth with the big uh, gouging teeth to, to latch onto our native fish and suck their body fluids, it's all bad stuff. But there's not a lot of things that eat these, right? In their native habitat, there might be, but not so much here in the Great Lakes. So they don't have predators so much. They um, outcompete, right? Does anybody else do this in the Great Lakes? The latching on and sucking body fluids? No. So they, they have a, the whole niche to themselves and they do a lot of stuff, right? So those are all good signs of an invasive species, which makes them a bad thing, right? Those are not good things. So we're gonna be talking about invasive carp. So we know that carp is a fish, right? We've narrowed that down. Um, goldfish are related to carp, right? So the ones you have in your tank can become invasive. Sometimes people release them. Again, totally human's fault, right? We let them go in places we shouldn't and they become an invasive species. So we're gonna talk about these invasive carp, but the story does not start in Michigan as most of the time happens. So um, there were several species of carp that were introduced on purpose in southern states into aquaculture farms. So an aquaculture farm, they have big earthen ponds um, on their property where they're raising fish. So sometimes like catfish or tilapia, if you've ever eaten tilapia, can be farm raised and they're raising them in these ponds to sell them for people to eat. So they have these aquaculture facilities in these ponds and maybe they're having problems with uh, bad algae, bad plants, right? So they bring in a species of carp from Asia um, that eats that bad algae, right? So maybe they bring in uh, a grass carp, which is the one that Rebecca was holding in that picture. They bring in that grass carp to take care of all those bad plants, right? Well, then maybe they're having snail and, you know, mollusk problems. So they bring in another species of carp from Asia called a black carp that eats mollusks, right? So it's taking care of the snail problems. So they brought these carp in for different reasons to these aquaculture facilities. And the problem was they got out. So there were huge floods down there and these fish were able to get out of these aquaculture ponds and escape into the Mississippi River. So you can see this is a carp, right? This is a road. So carp should not be able to swim down roads. They shouldn't be able to escape their ponds and get to the Mississippi River. And that's exactly what happened. So we have species of carp that are native in Asia that have now been brought here to the United States and they were doing their job and they were being okay until they escaped into that natural environment, right? Which is never a good thing. So what we're gonna do now is learn a little bit more about those different species of carp, right? So we said that there was multiple species and they all kind of have a thing. So let's learn those species of carp. So the first one is the one that my friend Rebecca was holding. The, that is a grass carp. So these are very large carp um, and they have very large scales. So they're pretty identifiable. Like you can see each scale there, right? Uh, big mouths. These guys like to eat vegetation and algae and aquatic plants. Um, one of the big problems with these guys is they don't know when to stop, right? So if there is a lot of vegetation along a shoreline, these guys will get right up in there and start eating all that vegetation and they can actually cause erosion problems and a lot of mud to slide into these bodies of water. So not necessarily a good thing. And that's not even considering the fact that they're eating plants that our native animals need. Whether they eat them, they use them as habitat to hide, they use them for shelter, or a lot of fish species like lay eggs on or around or in plants under the water. So they're damaging all of that habitat as well. So bad, bad thing. The next species is silver carp. So now these ones don't get quite as big, um, but they like to travel with their friends. So they travel in big schools, up to hundreds of fish, and they have a really bad habit. So when they are startled, and by startled, I don't mean something really catastrophic, like even just a boat motor, or you banged your kayak paddle on the side of your boat too hard. Um, these fish jump out of the water, right? So when they're startled, they jump out of the water, and it's not just one fish, it's many, 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 many fish, right? And these can be like, 
you know, 30 pounds. Have you ever been hit by something flying that weighed 30 pounds? Probably not, right? Have you ever been hit by like a dodgeball? That doesn't feel good, right? And that weighs nothing. So imagine something that's 30 pounds jumping out of the water and smashing into you. They can break arms and fingers and jaws, right? They can damage your boat and your equipment. So bad, bad thing, right? Our next species is the black carp. So this one, very big fish again, right? Standing next to this adult man. Um, they also have those really big scales that you can see almost every individual scale. These guys are the ones that eat mollusks, right? So they very specifically eat those snails, zebra mussels, things like that. Now, some people have argued maybe that would be a good thing to have in the Great Lakes. We have lots of zebra mussels. We have lots of invasive quagga mussels. They're damaging the ecosystem. Maybe this black carp would help take care of the problem, right? They'd come in and eat all those bad mussels. The problem is when they came in and they eat all those bad mussels, would they stop when they ran out of bad mussels? No, they'd keep going and they would eat our native clams and mussels and snails. So not necessarily a good thing, right? We don't want to disturb our system. Our last species is the big head carp. Again, very large fish, taking two guys to hold this one. They're very identifiable because they have this huge eye that's below their mouth. So they kind of look funny, right? Big, huge mouth. And these guys very specifically eat plankton. So a gigantic fish that eats teeny, teeny, tiny little things. So they just kind of swim around with their mouth open and filter them all in and eat those plankton up. Doesn't sound too bad. Till you think about the fact that the zebra mussels have already eaten tons and tons of our plankton. And our small fish and other animals need that plankton to live. Now you're going to introduce a fish that can weigh like 100 pounds that can eat half its body weight a day in plankton. So that fish is going to eat 50 pounds of plankton a day, potentially, at least 20, right? 20 pounds of plankton a day is a lot of plankton that our native animals can't use, right? So bad things. So if we consider the fact that we've got potentially four species that have escaped into the Mississippi River, right? Is the Mississippi River short? Yeah, no, right? It's a really long river and it's connected to a lot of other rivers. So could this potentially become a really big problem? For sure, right? So let's look at how this invasion happened. So we've got um, map of the United States here, and you can see in 1975, they were found right here, these little red dots in Arkansas. And then what happens? Well, they start to get out and they start to spread and they spread all over the country. Now let's watch this as it goes through because it'll start over here in a second. So they start in Arkansas, but then all of a sudden they show up in Colorado and Texas where there's no water, right? And out here in Florida, the part that makes sense is that they escaped here and they go up the Mississippi River like this, right? And it makes sense they would get onto these other rivers that are connected to the Mississippi River, those tributary rivers that are connected to the Mississippi. But how on earth did they get out into the middle of Colorado, in the middle of Texas, right? Again, totally people's fault. So it probably was somebody that had been fishing on the Mississippi River and there was young carp tangled up in their gear maybe or sucked into their boat motor or you know their uh, water tanks or maybe they found them as bait fish and took them back to Colorado and they escaped into the natural environment. So again, it's not birds flying all that way and dropping these, it's probably humans' fault. So we've got this invasion started and it's spreading all over the country quite quickly, right? So what year was the first picture? 1975. And now we're in 2020, right? And you can see they are right on the edge of Lake Michigan, but they aren't in Lake Michigan yet. So now we need to think about ge geography a little bit, right? So the Mississippi River comes up, there are tributaries that come closer and closer to the Great Lakes. And historically, the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River were not connected. But we as humans, you know, we like to fix things. So we connected them, um, which at the time made a lot of sense, right? Because that's for good business. Those ships that are shipping things all over the Great Lakes and the barges that are going up and down the Mississippi River, now they can connect somehow, right? And we can transfer goods and we can ship it um, along these rivers from the Great Lakes down the Mississippi or vice versa. So we've got all this shipping opportunity, but it made a connection between the Mississippi River system and the Great Lakes. So we did that with the Chicago area waterway. So you can see here's some rivers, right? And they look natural, they're all zigzaggy. And then you have up here, this blue section, 
is the part that we engineered. So humans made these. We designed them. We picked the direction. A lot of them are channelized, which they have like concrete on the sides and the bottom and they're nice straight looking tubes. But we made this Chicago area waterway to connect Lake Michigan ports to the rivers that can go down to the Mississippi. So on these rivers are barge traffic. So barge are those flat boats that they can load a lot of stuff on and they kind of move slow. Some of them have their own engines, other ones get pulled by like tugboats. But these barges are moving goods up and down the river. Now we did do one thing, right? We put some dams in because the water level is different, right? So at these dams, it stops the water and it makes a pool behind it. But they can also put a lot in. And we'll talk about locks in a second, but that's a way to move boats from lower water to higher water or the other way around, right? So by putting these dams in, the fish can't just swim all the time and get up the whole river, right? They run into that dam and they can't keep going. But then we put the locks in that basically is like an extra doorway for those fish to get through. So what we're looking at in a lot of places in the country where all those red dots were in the map, they're trying to eradicate, they're trying to contain these um, invasive carp. And now in some places, they're just trying to manage for the long term. There's so many of these fish, how are they possibly going to keep up and get all of them out of the system? What we're he doing here in Michigan is we're still way over here in the prevention phase. They haven't gotten to Lake Michigan yet, and we do not want them to get here, right? So we are in super duper problem solving mode, trying to solve the problem before it ever gets to us. Um, once they do, we're gonna have to hit eradication mode really hard, right? We have response crews that are ready to like zoop, zip out and take care of the problem and try to get these fish out of the system before they can have babies, right? Cause they're gonna have lots of babies and they're gonna grow very quickly. And they're gonna outcompete. So we wanna get ahead of the curve. So there are a few things in the way, and one of them is electric barriers. So these electric barriers, if you've ever run around your house in socks and then touch someone and zap to them, kind of like that, or your dog has a radio fence collar, um, it kind of just gives them a little jolt. But the hope is that that fish swimming along that goes over the electric barrier is gonna get a jolt and turn around and go the other way, right? So that's kind of the only defense we have right now. So if you think about it, these are not small fish, right? So let's review our species here for a minute. So we had that one that doesn't get huge, you know, they can get 30 pounds, and they like to hang out with their friends, and they like to jump. They have that big eye, right, kind of below their mouth. Not quite as big a mouth, but these guys, these plankton, nice big huge fish, right? These are the silver carp, right? These are the ones that jump. So the silver carp is the one that jumps. Now what about the one that ate mollusks, right? This one, again, fish biologists are really creative when we name things. What did we name this one that is the black color? No, it's the black carp, right? And this is the guy that eats mollusks, right? A little bit of a different mouth. Their eye is still huge, but their head's a little smaller, so it's almost like in the center. So these black carp, again, very identifiable. They have these huge individual scales. They eat those mollusks, and um, they could potentially do a lot of damage, right? But again, a very big fish. The one in that picture was almost as tall as that man. So not a small fish, but big fish, right? And then, whoop, got too many things. Our other species that we're really worried about is the big head carp. So this one's got kind of a speckly appearance, and you saw that in the picture where the two guys were holding it. They have that big, huge eye that's kind of below their mouth. They are kind of like looking up for predators all the time, especially when they're little. When they're this big, are they looking for predators? who's going to eat them, right? But these big head carp are the ones that eat plankton, up to, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 pounds a day of plankton, and they can get very large, right? Big fish. So we've got these really big species. The other species was grass carp, and I looked them out for a very specific reason. So they're kind of already here. We already have a population of grass carp in Lake Erie, right? But we are keeping very close tabs on them. So we keep track of like where they try to go to spawn. And we have a program where they put these little probes in them where they pass buoys and it sends a signal to the satellite and tells us exactly where that fish is and where it's going, right? We keep very good track of these grass carp um, in the hopes of eradicating them, right? So they're already here. We're in that next phase of that, that curve, that invasion curve, and we're trying to eradicate them. So right now we're trying to understand where they go and where they live and get rid of them, right? So the ones we're worried about coming into Lake Michigan are those other three species. So the silver carp, the one that jumps, 
It's the big head carp that gets huge and the black carp, the one that eats snails and mollusks and stuff. So we've got those three species that we're worried about coming into Lake Michigan. And again, it's through that Chicago area waterway. So let's look at that again. So here is Lake Michigan, right up here. We've got Lake Michigan up here. We connected it with this Chicago area waterway, the blue ones, and then back to what was a normal river system. And these red dots are those dams we talked about. So it's like a wall, the water washes over it, the fish can't swim past the wall. And what we have found with all the different teams that are out there doing research is there are some carp in between some of these dams. So they've snuck in with barge traffic through the locks or some other way. Here's a purple dot. So this one was like 2015. We have some other ones here, a green dot, and then a yellow and orange dot, very, very close. To Lake Michigan. So not good things. And those yellow, the yellow dot was in 2010, the orange dot was in 2017. So that wasn't very long ago. So you'll sometimes see in the news where carp have been sighted in places where they're physically seeing the fish. Other times you'll hear it called um, testing through eDNA. So, you know, everybody has DNA, all plants and animals have DNA. Um, and you slough that into the world, right? So you lose skin cells, you lose hair, right? You, you see it on like crime dramas where they're like found a hair follicle and they can test for somebody's DNA. Um, fish do that too, right? They lose scales, especially if you're being fished or caught in nets, right? They're gonna pull some scales off. So they can leave bits of DNA in the water and eDNA tests for that. So it's finding bits of DNA in the water system. Is it finding fish? No. Right? So when they say they found eDNA, they have, they can allude to the presence of fish, but they haven't proven there are fish there. Could that eDNA have come off the bottom of a boat that had been fishing somewhere else that had lots and lots of carp? Yep. Could it have come off fishing gear and nets and barges, right, that have come from places that are heavily infested with these invasive carp? Yes. But it does give us an indicator of where the edge of the problem is, right? If we're finding eDNA, at this, you know, far, far end, that's a bad thing, right? That means at least pieces of these fish are getting close to the Great Lakes. Bad, bad problem, right? So one of the biggest answers that most people come up with is, let's just close those Chicago area waterways, right? Let's just close them down, lock them up. Well, here's where the problem comes in. A lot of stuff goes through there on barges and different um, vessels. So here are some of the things that go through there. So you have agriculture items, um, crude oil, uh, petro, which is, you know, like gas, coal, um, to run power plants, right? We would like our electricity. We would like the power to stay on. Um, different ores, iron and steel. Do they kind of need like metal in Detroit to make cars and in Lansing to make cars? Yeah, so we can't just cut these off, right? There's a lot of things that go into it. So when we're talking about solutions, the easiest one isn't necessarily the most feasible because there's a lot of other pieces in play. So by cutting those off, we could cut off the carp, but we're cutting off all of that business as well, right? So we're making more problems potentially that we need to solve in other ways. And the thing is, it's not just us involved. It's not just here in Michigan. When we look at that map, right, it's Michigan, it has four of the Great Lakes touching us, but those lakes also touch Ohio, Illinois, Wisconsin, you know, Minnesota for a bit, Canada, and then out on the other end, they're touching New York and Pennsylvania. So all these Great Lakes are attached to a bunch of states, and they're also attached to another country. So when we're trying to make decisions, does Michigan just get to say, nope, cut it off, just block off the traffic, you can't let them in? Well, no, because it's not our state. It's in Chicago, right? It's in Illinois. So we have to work together with all these other states. And it's not just the DNRs of all those states, but then you also have federal groups, right? And you have side groups that work with all the different partners. So we have the US Fish and Wildlife Service that my friend works for, and they're kind of the national level, right? There's the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, which has partners from the different states and Canada that all work together to try to do research and make decisions. And then you have Canada's equivalent of the US Fish and Wildlife Service and their DNR, right? So all of these different partners have to work together. And it's not just the biologists, because many scientists like me are super rational, right? We're just like, fix the problem, just make it go away. We don't want this problem. And then you have other people that are more emotional and worry about the people and the emotions of the situation. 
and the money, right? So you have accountants that are worried about the money and you have politicians that are worried about the laws and how it would interact um, between the countries. So there's all these people that have to be involved in making decisions. And the first thing we need to do is come up with a place to even do some of these solutions. So the thing that has been proposed is a spot called the Brandon Road Lock and Dam. So it's on that Chicago area waterway. And this is Brandon Road here. You can see it kind of cutting across. And this is a dam. So that's the Brandon Road Dam. This is a lock. So like I said, a lock is kind of like an elevator for a boat. So the boat is gonna travel up here, that barge, right? They're gonna open up these little doors. It's gonna go in. They're gonna shut the doors on both ends. They're gonna raise the water level up like an elevator. They're gonna open the doors on this end and let the boat out, right? If it's coming down this way, they're gonna do the same thing in reverse. So they're gonna let it in. They're gonna lower the water level, open the doors and let it out. But it's not just the boats going through there, right? Fish could travel through. The, bo the boats could kind of push the fish through even. So a lot of problems. So this is the area that we've started focusing on, but we need to come up with some more solutions. So those electrodes are in like a channel like this, right? But that's kind of the only line of defense. So let's zoom in and think about this a little bit more. So here's that dam, right? The fish can't get over this. They can't jump that far. Those silver carp can jump high, but they can't jump this high, right? So this part is probably taking care of itself but they can get up this portion. And here's those locked doors, right? The piece they open, here's the ones on this end. Right now the water's high in here because you can see a lot of the doors on this end. And when they open it up, the boat's gonna go out this way and fish could as well. So what could we implement around this channel and this lock that would be a better solution? Well, let's think about some of the options. So here are some of the things that are proposed um, and recommended by different biologists and different engineers. So one is a flushing lock, right? So that barge goes in, and when they're moving the water in and out of that lock, they're straining it basically, trying not to let babies through, and then they use high-pressured water maybe to move it out. So there's just different options for making a flushing lock, right? Um, another one is, you know, using these engineered channels to our advantage. So you've got concrete walls, right? Could you bounce sound off those to annoy the fish to make them go away? For sure. So that's where acoustic fish deterrents come in. We're using acoustic, right, is sound. So we're using noises to make these fish turn around and go away. What about an air bubble curtain, right? Well, so have you ever seen the bubbles? Well, you can see them in my tank here behind me, right? So the bubbles are coming up. Fish don't like to play in those except that one in Finding Nemo. But you could make an air bubble curtain that they don't want to swim through. So they don't want to swim through the bubbles and then they're going over all those electrodes, right? And then they're making a bunch of noise and then there's fast jet moving water. Would that deter the fish? Maybe. But now they actually have um, sonar footage of the little fish, right? The barge, you know, that big flat boat. On the front of it, the front of the boat is kind of square and it's got kind of a grate on the front. You know, the old tiny trains, you know, they have that metal cone on the front like this. What happens is those little fish can hang out in between and they can go with the barge right through a lot of that stuff. And the bubbles don't bug them as much. Maybe the sound wouldn't bubble, bug them as much. Maybe the electrodes won't bug them as much. So we could be dragging little babies through there. So would any of these solutions help with that? I don't know, right? So some other ones for the future, right? Uh, our former governor, Governor Snyder put together the Great Lakes Invasive Carp Challenge, and it was a $1 million challenge to uh, get people to submit solution, solutions. So some of the solutions being researched are those sound barriers, right, acoustic stuff, using carbon dioxide. So making those bubble walls, but not just making bubble walls, making it out of carbon dioxide, which they can't use to breathe, right, making it even more annoying. Um, one is to alter the barge traffic. So stop it, you know, cut that barge traffic off, right, that's one thing. Um, or maybe one of my teachers suggested you build like ramps where the barge gets taken out of the water, up, dried, cleaned off, and then dropped in on the other side. Could we use uh, chemicals, right? So that's another one of them. Chemicals to treat and kill those carp. But have we found chemicals that only kill carp and not our other fish? Not yet so much, right? We talked about water velocity barriers. We've talked about fish imaging and sorting systems. So that one's pretty cool. So that would be where like the fish are going in the water and there's like cameras that would basically identify the fish. And if it's a good fish, so say it's a walleye or a smallmouth bass hanging out in the river, it would go, you're a good fish and let them go through. 
if it goes, oh no, you're a carp, it would stop them and make them go a different way where we could get them out of the river, right? So fish imaging systems. The one that won the million dollars was a man that proposed um, cavitation bubbles. So these are bubbles, right? And as the bubble is collapsing, so getting smaller, it implodes. So exploding is this way, right? Imploding is this way. And when it implodes, it makes a shock wave, like a sonic boom from like a jet, right? So it makes a shock wave. It also makes light and heat, right? So this bubble is going to implode, going to make a shock wave that kind of bugs everything and shoots it away. It's going to make heat and it's going to make light. So we're hoping that that would annoy the fish enough to make them turn around and go the other way, right? And that's the big goal is we just don't want them to get to Lake Michigan. So this challenge was a few years ago. Do we have cavitation bubbles fighting off carp? No, <laughs> because we have to have all those partners work together. So even if all the DNRs for all those states and Canada and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission and all those pieces work together and said, this is the solution or this is the package of solutions and said that tomorrow, that just starts the next phase. Now we have to get the lawyers and the accountants and the politicians and the engineers together to agree. The engineers have to decide how to implement it and how would we build these things. Then you have to get the money people involved and who's going to pay for it? Which state is going to pay for it? Which country? Is it us? Is it, you know, Canada? It was kind of our fault, right? They were escaping in the U.S. So maybe Canada says, nope, it's your problem. You pay for it. So now you have all these other problems. And this is what's happening right now. There's tons of discussions and you'll see it in the news. And we're all working together to kind of come up with some of those solutions and then get them in place, right? So the Army Corps, Army Corps of Engineers is involved and we're trying to figure out ways to implement these projects and to pay for them. So this is where you guys come in, right? You are the future. You're gonna be future voters. You're gonna be future engineers and biologists and politicians, right? So understanding these problems helps you make better decisions later and support better solutions. Some people don't take much biology, right? If you're gonna be an accountant, maybe you didn't take much science in college. So when I come to you saying there's this problem with these fish that you've never seen before and they're gonna hurt other fish that you don't care about in an ecosystem you don't play in, are you gonna worry about it? No, but understanding the problem hopefully makes you wanna help and preserve those habitats, those animals, those species for the future. So you guys could be the future of the solution. It's still ongoing, it's not solved yet, and you could be the one that solves it, which is pretty cool. So I have a few minutes for questions, so if you guys find the Q&A button, you can actually type questions in there if you have any, and I'll answer those in a second, right? So um, do I work with other states? So I do actually, I am on um, a board called AREA, so it's the Aquatic Resource Education Association, and we are the aquatic educators for all the different states in the United States. So there's, uh, you know, people on that board and within that, you know, group that are from Texas and New Jersey and Alaska and Hawaii, right? So there's a bunch of different people in all those states that are doing what I do. Some of them do more of like fishing programs and they teach people to fish. Some of us work more on the education end and we work with schools and students to help you understand our aquatic systems. But there are definitely people like me in most states, right? And then in most countries. Um, could these fish harm salmon? So a lot of us are salmon in the classroom, right? You can see my little salmon behind me. Uh, they could, in the fact that they could mess up our food chain, right? So some of these, sand, or these carp eat lots and lots and lots of plankton, right? So the plankton feeds the small fish, the small fish feed the big fish, the big fish feed the salmon, right? Well, if there's no plankton on the bottom of that food pyramid, there's no little fish. And if there's no little fish, there's no big fish and salmon, right? So by knocking out a lot of our plankton, that we lose a lot of the bait fish that our salmon would eat. So they definitely could hurt our salmon in the future. How long have I been doing this? So I have had my job for a little over three years. Um, before this, I ran a nature center for about 10 years. And before that, I was a marine biologist and I worked at a couple different aquariums, one in South Carolina, one in Alaska. Um, I went to college in Hawaii and uh, loved doing marine biology and oceanography there. Just, it's hard to find jobs there. And I liked Michigan because I'm from here. So now I get to help take care of salmon and help teach people about salmon. And salmon are a Pacific Ocean species. So I think it's totally fitting, right? Marine biologists can take care of salmon. 
Um, somebody asked, what if these carp get used to those imploding bubbles? They could. They totally could. They could get used to every single one of these, right? Can you become desensitized to stuff? You just kind of get used to it. I just had hand surgery and I'm used to wearing like a splint and a band-aid on my hand now because it's been there for a couple weeks. You just get used to things, right? Um, so it could definitely be the case and we'd have to come up with new solutions all the time. Uh, how long did I go to school? I went to school. So I went to University of Michigan for one year. I was in fisheries research and I actually worked at the USGS, which is United States uh, Geologic, not society, that sounds wrong, but service. And um, they have a biological station at U of M. I helped take care of lake trout, which are our native fish that are really big, right? And I helped feed them and clean their tanks and take care of them. Um, I didn't love it at U of M. It's a lot bigger than like my town and I'm from a tiny town. So I ended up transferring to the University of Hawaii Hilo. And um, it's a tiny school. My first class at U of M had about 800 people in it. My first class in Hawaii had 10. I worked on the research vessel the whole time I was in Hawaii and I got to do a lot of really cool stuff that I never would have if I was at a bigger university. And um, what's funny is now when I work with all my colleagues at the DNR, a lot of them went to Lake Superior State University for fisheries, which is very similar, right? It's a small university. You get a lot of hands-on stuff. I didn't know it existed in high school. So I always joke that if I had a better high school counselor, I would have just gone to Lake Superior State in the UP rather than like 5,000 miles away in Hawaii. But it was very cool. Then I got a master's degree, so that took me a few more years, and I did that at Michigan State. So my master's degree is in zoo and aquarium management and non-formal education. So this, right? I'm not your real classroom teacher. I just come in to help. So pretty interesting degrees, and there's a lot of stuff. So within the DNR, there's like everything you could think. I mean, we don't have hairdressers or anything, but we do have a lot of other jobs. So we have pilots that fly planes so we can do surveys of animals, right? We have drone pilots that fly drones. We have graphics designers that make stuff pretty. We have accountants that take care of our money. We have a social media guy that takes care of Twitter and, you know, Instagram. So we have lots of jobs in the DNR. So if you like wildlife, but you don't necessarily want to be a biologist, you can still help protect and preserve our natural resources um, by doing one of those other jobs. Because there's over a thousand of us in the DNR. Um, <laughs> do I think that you could take this over in a few years? Like what I do? Totally right? Um, when I was first going to college, what I did was I wrote letters back, you know, email was a thing, but I wrote real letters and mailed them to um, people that had jobs that I thought were cool and that I would want someday. So I wrote these letters saying, I would love your job one day. How do I get to be where you are? How do I get to do what you do? And a lot of them wrote me back, right? Especially nowadays with the email, people would like just crank out an email. I do it all the time. I help people figure out about colleges and degrees and things they would like. Because a lot of people think the DNR is either just biologists or just conservation officers, right? When they say, I want to work for the DNR, a lot of people mean, I want to be a conservation officer. I want to be an animal police officer. And that's all they know that we do. So helping you guys understand that there's all these different careers. And if you like fish, or tr my best friend likes trees, right? She got a forestry degree, and she helps keep invasive plants out of state forests. That's her whole job. She drives with a big truck with sauce and poison and they cut down invasive bushes and get them out of our state for us. So if you like those things, you can learn about those things and you can learn to protect them. If you like them, but you'd rather, you know, design pretty logos and, and signs and posters like the one behind me, you can be a graphics designer and do the same thing, right? So these are all good things and I'm so glad you guys joined me. You had excellent questions today. So I wanna thank you for joining me and, um, this recording will be up on our Salmon in the Classroom playlist on our Michigan DNR YouTube channel. And I have about 40 other videos that are up there as well. So I'm adding about four to five videos a week from right here in my tank. I also have a little microscope that hooks to my computer and I'm doing all sorts of cool video content that I'm adding on that Salmon in the Classroom playlist. So definitely be sure to check that out and keep up with our little baby salmon here because you see him zipping around behind me. I wanted to share a few other resources we have available to you. For teachers, you can visit michigan.gov backslash nature at school, and you can find a whole host of topics that you can book as live virtual programs, like a virtual field trip right in your classroom or right through your computer. We have about 11 topics right now with more coming soon. 
um, or families or homeschool groups can go to Nature at School and book a webinar format. So we offer our topics as webinars where as many people as possible can join. Not quite as interactive because we don't see our students, but those webinars are super educational and very much like this History of Salmon presentation was. Another resource we have available is called Nature at Home. Again, michigan.gov slash nature at home. And this is filled with zillions of resources. So class activities, home activities, where you can get out in nature and do some cool stuff. Different video playlists to help you connect with all sorts of pieces of nature. So a great way to get your family outside and enjoying nature throughout all of our seasons here in Michigan. Our other resource is our My Nature DNR Facebook page. This is kind of the warm and fuzzy side of the DNR. So each day of the week, we share cool, fun content that has um, wildlife in it. It has different opportunities, places to visit, all sorts of stuff. So definitely find My Nature DNR on Facebook and like that. Again, thank you so much for being here and I hope to, that you take advantage of some of our other webinar opportunities.